Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm with OCTO, Open Communications for the Ocean. At OCTO, I am coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, as well as editor of the Skimmeron Marine Ecosystems and Management. Um, and I, we have with me today my colleague, John Davis of OCTO. Um, we are very pleased to welcome John Hare, director of the NOAA Fisheries Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, we're very pleased to welcome John here today to talk about using an incremental approach for wicked problems in fisheries management and marine EBM. Before I turn things over to John, I just wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, you, there's, a, there's a question panel in your user interface. If you can just send in the questions through the question panel, feel free to send them in any time. We have dedicated time at the end of the presentation for Q&A, but feel free to send in questions during the presentation. Um, and we'll, ha we'll handle questions at the end. I will uh, read them aloud to John uh, for uh, discussion and answers. Um, so thank you everyone for being here and, and thank you so much, John. I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate the opportunity and thank you to Octo for you know, providing the venue to talk about uh, sort of how I'm thinking about approaching ecosystem-based management. Um, these, the, um, the work that I'm gonna talk about today sort of is, comes from two different uh, pieces. One is a, uh, food for Thought piece in the ICES Journal of Marine Science that was uh, published sort of early 2020, right at the, just before the, the pandemic, and then a shorter essay based on that Food for Thought and Skimmer. Um, and thank you to Sarah for reaching out and asking if I would write something for the Skimmer article. So I'm just going to talk through some of the salient points from those two uh, written pieces. And if, you, if you're interested, um, certainly, I could refer you back to those two written pieces. Um, so, the, you know, the question, why did I write sort of a food for thought article or, or well, my perspective on, on managing in marine ecosystems or why the Skimmer article? Um, again, it is, it's my perspective um, and it sort of represents a transition that I've made from a research scientist to a federal bureaucrat. And I use that federal bureaucrat language lovingly. Um, and then just trying to make sense of my job as a bureaucrat from the perspective of a scientist. And then what lessons could I take from, from making sense of my job and how to use that going forward. So that's why I wrote uh, these two pieces and why I'm here talking with you today. Again, just to go through my sort of my perspective, my story, my background in a little detail. You know, I spent the first 10 years of my career at a you know, university uh, first, my Bachelor of Art and then a PhD in Oceanography from SUNY Stony Brook. And although at the time I would not have characterized that as have, having been in an ivory tower, when I look back onto that time, I can see sort of elements of the ivory tower. My, my goal during those first 10 years was to learn and to gain experience and to, you know, to become a scientist. And so it was a very sort of self-focused time. Uh, sort of helping me learning, focusing on myself to gain experience, which has a lot of elements of sort of that ivory tower um, mentality, as it were. The next 10 years of my career, I spent at the NOAA Beaufort Laboratory, and that's actually where Sarah and I met. We worked together uh, for a while while I, while I was in Beaufort and she was in Beaufort. Um, and I was a research scientist working for NOAA. That's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And my topic area or my discipline, where I had expertise, where I was developing expertise, is in fisheries oceanography. Um, and that sort of defines as how the ocean affects fish population. You know, my main goals well in Beaufort were primarily scientific. Uh, you know, it was to, to conduct scientific research, to publish scientific papers, um, and to hope that those scientific papers would influence the field of science and also potentially the field of management. I've never gone back and looked through, but I imagine many of those early papers uh, indicated that the work was important to fisheries management, um, but I can also say that much of that was never translated into fisheries management. So it was still, even this time at Bofa was still very focused on, on research. The next step I made in my career is I moved to the Narragansett Laboratory, again, still working with NOAA, uh, 
uh, fisheries oceanography is sort of my discipline or area of expertise, um, but started to sort of move into understanding climate change in fisheries. And this, you know, really the, the topics are very similar, um, but it sort of becomes that sort of simplified statement about what climate in fisheries is, and it's how the changing ocean affects fish populations. So the, the transition into climate change in fisheries was nat felt natural for me. Uh, you know, so I think it's very similar to fisheries oceanography. And I've written here that, you know, during these 10 years, I really started learning fisheries management by osmosis. Um, I was in the Northeast where there was a lot of interest in fisheries management and fisheries. Um, I was working in a group which was starting to provide data and science to inform the fisheries management process. I was still had a main priority on writing papers and publishing science, but also started engaging and moving that science into the management process. I had taken fisheries management courses in graduate school, um, but what I was learning through just practice and what I wrote here is osmosis was very different from anything that I had learned from the textbooks in school. And so uh, sort of learning as I went, uh, just you know, uh, trial and error as it were. Then in 2016, I had the opportunity to apply for the director of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, it was, you know, recognizing when I applied that I would be stepping out of a uh, primarily scientific goal and more into a bureaucratic administrative goal. Um, and so I thought long and hard about whether I wanted to make that shift or not. And in the end, I did, obviously. Um, and my, you know, the way I sort of conveyed that to myself was as director of the Northeast Fishery Science Center, I could create an environment whereby scientists could conduct the best science possible and that we could work to move that science in inform management. So it's really sort of in creating an environment for other scientists to work and do their job. Um, the NOAA fisheries sort of remit, the, the sort of the breadth of what we work on, what we're required to work on uh, through a number of laws is broad. Uh, it's marine fisheries, you know, we're the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, we have fisheries in our name. Uh, we also do a lot of science and provide advice on protected species, which are whales, dolphins, sea turtles, seals, uh, salmon, sturgeon, just the whole range of species that are protected under both the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. We also do a lot of work on marine habitats, marine ecosystems, and the climate change effects on all of these, climate change effects on fisheries, protected species, habitats, ecosystem. Um, we also are you know, sort of moving into or uh, being asked to engage or needing to engage with other ocean users. Um, traditionally, the marine environment has been used um, by commercial fishermen, um, more recently recreational fishermen. Um, now uh, aquaculture is well established within coastal waters and is considering moving out into ocean waters and wind energy development is moving out into ocean waters. So we now have multiple ocean uses and from the fisheries perspective, how do we provide science to support the use of the ocean for fisheries, the use of the ocean by whales and dolphins and sea turtles, the use of the ocean for aquaculture, the use of the ocean for wind energy development. The other challenging piece about the job is it works at sort of all scales. Uh, we are the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, so we focus on the Northeast United States, which is North Carolina to Maine. Um, we also work from the top of watersheds out into the open ocean. Um, but because ecosystems don't draw neat lines at political boundaries, uh, we, work, uh, we work with uh, agencies and organizations and scientists to the south of us in the, in the southeast and to the north of us in Canadian waters. And then we are engaged internationally, primarily across the North Atlantic. So the you know, the, the job, the director, the role of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is quite broad. And that, that challenge uh, attracted me to try to create an environment where scientists could work 
um, and be productive and conduct science that contributes to these problems. Um, so I was director, I'm still director, but from you know October 2016 to 2018, learning the job, um, learning how to keep things going, uh, you know, making sure that our surveys happen, making sure that our data collection happens, making sure that we're producing the science to give to the managers, fisheries managers, protected species managers, starting to engage with wind energy developers and offshore aquaculture. And I think you know this sort of aspect, these initial years of the job, we had a lot of similarities to a hamster wheel. You get the wheel going, and once the wheel's going, you can't slow it down. The only thing you can do is speed it up. So uh, very much on sort of the hamster wheel during those first couple of years. And then in December 2018, uh, January 2019, there was a federal government shutdown. So government shutdown for 35 days. Um, it was an enforced, you can't go to work, you can't go to your office, you can't use your computer. Um, you know, there's no, no interaction with uh, sort of the NOAA fisheries mission. And so in a sense, this is kind of similar to a sabbatical in a university. Um, and you know, I've got the definition of a sabbatical here on the right. It's an extended leave, uh, usually tied to an educational or academic goal. So, you know, recognizing that this was a, a break in the hamster wheel, um, you know, I thought about how could I use this break uh, constructively for some educational or academic goal. And what I thought to do during that time was to sort of reflect on where I was in terms of director and where you know the Northeast Fisheries Science Center was in terms of doing its job, providing science advice to these important questions. And so, you know, you go back and look at sort of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center vision, sort of what we are supposed to be doing. Um, and it's conduct ecosystem-based research and assessments of living marine resources to promote the recovery and long-term sustainability of these resources and to generate social and economic opportunities and benefits from their use. Now that certainly is a mouthful. Um, and you know, even reading through it to you, I kind of just kind of forget what some of the words were at the beginning, reading through some of the words at the end. So just to, you know, try to really trim it down and, and make it just into single or a couple of words. It's science for sustainable marine ecosystems and resources to provide social and economic opportunity. And when you look at that definition of mission, of vision, what we're describing is science to support socio-ecological system. Um, and you know, coming from a, a pure science background, uh, fisheries oceanography, and continuing to sort of take a broader and broader look at the problem as I developed in my career, you know, thinking about fisheries management or protected species management from the context of this large socio-ecological system, you know, one could convey that it becomes overwhelming. So I was approaching the system from that blue arrow on the right, uh, sort of from a climate and ocean drivers, ecological interactions. But, you know, assuming that this is a socio-ecological system, there are all these other components to it, um, which I wasn't really engaging in. And so starting to think about how to work effectively as a scientist, as a leader of a scientific organization in this very complex uh, socio-ecological system. And so to you know, summarize, I would say early in my career, being trained as a scientist, I would work to sort of isolate problems into a manageable size and then address those problems through deductive reasoning. And as I sort of move through my career, and during this period of reflection, you know, realize that it's the problems are much bigger. The ability to isolate a problem and address it through deductive reasoning is limited um, because everything is connected and every problem is more complicated than it seems. And so in my mind, I started imagining sort of a Gordian knot um, of issues. I've just been, I put some labels on this Gordian knot just to help make my point. You know, we're, we're concerned in the Northeast United States with the interaction between North Atlantic right whales 
and the lobster fishery. And that certainly affects fishing communities in the Northeast. Um, some of that connection is being driven by climate changes in both whales and in lobsters. So we've got climate in this problem. Um, and then the lobster fishery is using herring as bait, but the herring fishery, the herring population is, is um, quite low, depleted. Um, so there's a bait problem. Part of the relationship, the relationship between herring and sand lamps and apparent oscillation. So you start trying to think about how this problem continues to grow and become more complicated. So how can, as a scientist, how can we address these large complicated problems is where sort of I came to um, sort of as I was thinking about what we were doing at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And so again, I got 35 days, sort of set a goal for myself to just really sit and think about what I was doing um, and what where we were going as an organization. Uh, some of colleagues previously had sort of brought this idea of wicked problems to my attention. Um, you know, then there's a, the definition is difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, ill-defined and changing requirements. And, you know, reading that definition and knowing the areas where we were trying to make scientific progress, you know, I realized that I was working in a sort of a wicked problem environment. And I would argue that many of us are, or most of us are. Um, you know, I've got the site here to the dilemmas in the general theory of planning where that the terminology wicked problems really was starting to be used. Um, it's nice because it's sort of got a ring to it, you know, a wicked problem, you know, it's an attractive two words to say, um, but there's a whole body of public policy literature built on this concept of wicked problems. And that's what I started to delve into during this 35 day enforced sabbatical. Um, so reading more, uh, there's an excellent paper in Science in 2017 by DeFries and Magendra, um, and they talk about wicked problems and ecosystem management, which I think is directly relevant for all of us here. And they describe two traps uh, in thinking about working on these wicked problems. The first trap is falsely assuming a tame solution. So I, I, you know, in my own mind, I thought of this as Smeagol and his ring, and the idea that there is one solution to rule them all. You know, that's a false assumption in these wicked problems. There are multiple solutions, um, and our job is to sort of define what those multiple solutions are. And then the other trap that they described was this inaction from overwhelming complexity. And you know, I can characterize this as, let's just keep doing what we're doing uh, because the problem is so complicated, we can't do anything else. And I've got this image of an Escher diagram where the individuals walk up, keep walking up the stairs, but they're actually walking in a circle. Um, and certainly I have in my sort of time as Northeast Fisheries Science Center Director have experienced sort of both of these traps. I've seen them, people talking about problems in this light, that there has to be a, one solution to this problem or you know, we should not address this problem because it's too complicated for us. So I, I see wicked problems in what in the work that we are doing in NOAA Fisheries. And so to just start trying to conceptualize where I was in terms of problem solving and where I thought we should go in terms of problem solving, I put together two figures in that food for thought article, which I'm gonna share with you now. The first one is sort of where I was where I think uh, NOAA Fisheries is to some extent, where I think sort of science is in terms of working in ecosystem problems. It, it comes from that, an ivory tower um, that we can train experts and put them in organizations and institutions as scientists, and we can take problems to them, they can work on the problem and then give the answer back. Um, and I, you know, I've described it here that you know, in, in, in fisheries management, we tend to have a number of groups involved on the management side, and then we try to separate sort of the science um, and pass problems to the scientists, and the scientists provide answers back. And reading sort of through the wicked problems literature, reading, delving into the public policy literature, this 
This model is based on a public policy paradigm it's called the rational comprehensive approach, where you train experts and as I said, put them in institutions and that expertise and institution then becomes where you solve problems uh, comprehensively and they do so rationally. And the wicked problem alternative is, uh, it's an alternative to that rational comprehensive approach and it's called the incremental approach. Um, is it, you know, a very good, uh, it's a very thick paper by Turnbull and Hope that sort of describe the wicked problem concept and how it relates to this rational comprehensive policy approach. Um, and this figure is, is one again from the food for thought paper that for me tried to summarize how to get at these wicked problems. First is to recognize that science is only one perspective of the problem. So the eye is sort of on the exterior of this problem field. Science is one of these eyes. Other stakeholders have other perspectives of the problem. The incremental approach recommends or calls for these different stakeholders to work together, not only to work together to solve the problem, but first to work together to define the problem, then work together to define the processes for solving the problem, and then work together to find solutions or options to solve the problem. Um, so it's a much more collective approach to problem solving than the rational comprehensive approach. Um, and then the, you know, the, the, the greater the difference between the perspectives of your stakeholders, uh, the more complicated, the harder that problem is going to be to solve. And to the extent that stakeholders can come to common perspectives of the problem, that problem will become easier to solve. And then the other piece of, of the wicked problem concept is that you know, problems as early on, and I mentioned that they're, they're unsolvable. Um, so there's this idea that they're continually to be worked on. And in that sense, they have a, a past, they have a present, and they have a future. Um, and, and with a past, present, and future, that means that problems in this problem field have inertia. Uh, the natural tendency is going to continue in the same direction as it had been going in the past and present. And so we've got this path dependency, which is something that's sort of part of this incremental approach, which needs to be deliberately thought about. So now, you know, sort of thinking about where I was, I really was in a culture, a thought process of that rational comprehensive approach, realizing that I, you know, need to be thinking in a more incremental approach and not really having the experience in that. Um, so I uh, it wrote down 10 lessons for myself uh, to just take forward in the work that I am doing now that we are doing now at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. And that first lesson is to just accept that fisheries are part of a complex socio-ecological system. It's, it's not just fish and fishing, it's all those elements of the complex socio-ecological system, including humans. And it's, you know, at some point we're gonna get to the place where we, when we say ecosystems, Everyone understands that that is, a, is inclusive of us, um, but I still think we need to acknowledge that humans are part of ecosystems and they are part of these socio-ecological complex systems. The second lesson for myself from through, through this reflection and thinking is that we need to strengthen the existing adaptive management processes and institutions. When I started sort of drawing the contrast between the rational comprehensive approach and the incremental approach, I realized that you know, much of fisheries management, marine fisheries management in the US is actually based on an incremental approach. Um, and I, you know, it's on my to-do list to go back and look at the history of the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Management and Conservation Act, but the, the group that wrote that law had a lot of the elements of this incremental approach in there. So fisheries management, marine fisheries management in the US 
the decisions are made by a fisheries management council, which is made up of different stakeholders. Um, and so that different stakeholders are represented and they, we manage fisheries iteratively. So we will do a stock assessment, set management regulations, and then at some point in the one, two, three years in the future, do another stock assessment and set um, regulations again. So we have elements of this incremental approach already in our fisheries management processes. We also have them already in some of our protected species management processes. So a lesson for myself is to really strengthen the adaptive management pieces of what we're already doing. Lesson number three is to really encourage and engage in participatory science. Um, we talked about stakeholders uh, sort of having different views of a problem, science being one perspective of, of many. And we've talked about uh, in the fisheries management process, stakeholders being in the decision-making part of that process. And so what we need to do as scientists is take that participatory management mantra and really think about what would participatory science look like. And there, you know, there's a lot of literature on the value of co-production of knowledge. Um, so that's what we're talking about here, working as scientists with other stakeholders, participatory science to co-produce knowledge to be used in, in solving and in addressing the problems that we are trying to address. There's 10 lessons, so we got two more slides of lessons, and this is four, five, six, and seven. Lesson four is the question inertia. Um, we talked about how every problem has a past, present, and future, and that inertial course of a problem is to continue in the same direction that it had been going in the past and present. Um, so you, we, you know, doesn't mean that it's going in the wrong direction, um, but we need to check and make sure that it's going in the direction that we want it to be going. In. And that's sort of the question, the inertia of a problem. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but just fundamentally ask, is this going in the right direction? If yes, let it go. If no, what course corrections need to be made and how can those course corrections be made? Number five is respect all perspectives. Um, we've talked about each stakeholder group has a different perspective of the problem. Science is only one of multiple perspectives. Science is no better or no worse than these other perspectives. It's no more valuable or less valuable. It is a different perspective based on a different culture and a different philosophical mindset, but these other perspectives also have value. And thus we need to respect all perspectives of a problem. In the fisheries management sort of realm where I do a lot of my work now, we need to recognize fishers as knowledge experts. Um, and this, you know, it's, it's, this came to me, um, there's a meeting in Maine called the Maine Fishermen's Forum. It's hosted by fishers for fishers, and sometimes they invite scientists to come and participate. So I was in a Maine Fisherman Forum meeting, listening to fishermen describe how they viewed the Gulf of Maine ecosystem to be working and realized that they had a conceptual map of that ecosystem and they were making decisions on where to go or not go to find fish to earn money in essence to catch fish and recognize that that is a conceptual map of the ecosystem and they're constantly testing that map by fishing in one area and not another area. So they have a lot of the components of sort of a scientific understanding of the system. They don't have the scientific training and some of the tools, um, but they very much are knowledge experts. And I would argue that many stakeholders of the systems that we work in similarly all are knowledge experts of those systems, but that knowledge could be different um, than ours, than the scientific knowledge. Um, number seven is, you know, you always need to consider the scale of the problem. Um, and we talked earlier about one of the traps of wicked problems is just that the problem is so overwhelming that it leads to inaction. So you, so you can't address the problem in its infinite large scale. Um, similarly, uh, you know, the, you can't 
think about addressing it at such a small scale, such a reduced level of complexity that um, your work is not significant to the broader problem. So, you know, it's kind of like that, um, you know, models of intermediate complexity, the MICE model theory. We need to be working in that sweet spot of complexity where we can make progress on a problem, um, but not be overwhelmed by the large scale or trapped in working in sort of too small of a scale to find the one tame solution. Three more lessons here, um, and then I'll finish up. Um, number eight is be open to changing your mind and adjusting your perspective. From my thinking, this is what a scientist has been trained to do. Uh, we've been trained to look at evidence objectively um, and make evidence-based decisions. So if evidence comes to us, which is counter to our current hypothesis or current beliefs, we should be changing our mind and adjusting our perspective. And I think we need to bring that open-mindedness, sort of evidence-based decision-mindedness to our working on these wicked problems. Number nine, you know, it's important to read, listen, and discuss broadly. Um, you know, it, I would not have had the opportunity to think about sort of the public policy culture that I was part of, nor think about how to make changes for what I think could be a better approach, the incremental approach. And if I had not had the opportunity to read, if I had not been listening to fishers at, at meetings and, and discussing with a broad range of stakeholders to understand their perspective. So it's just, it's critical to engage with others and to listen and think about what they're having to say. And then number 10, we need to publish and communicate the results of our science and management. You know, I think of this sort of two ways. One is, is you know, planting the flag or putting the crumbs out for others to follow. Um, you know, if as a scientist, I've spent 10 years working and then on the next day I get hit by a bus and do not come back into work, uh, what does that 10 years of science, what does that mean if I haven't published it or communicated it or put those flags in the ground or left those crumbs for other to follow? So if you look at the scientific process, you know, the last piece of the scientific process is to communicate. So it is beholden upon us to publish and communicate the results of our science and the results of our management. The successes in our engagement in the sort of management process and the failures of our engagement in the management process. And I, I, you know, recently, not recently, past five years or so, I am seeing more papers with a group of stakeholders talking about how they are working to solve these complicated problems. And I see that as a good sign that people are putting those flags in the ground for others to follow as to how to, how to follow this incremental approach. Um, so just to wrap up, um, you know, 100% honesty, there is nothing new here. Um, you know, what is new is my realization of the rich field of public policy uh, research um, and my ability to use these ideas in sort of the job that we are doing at the Northeast Fishery Science Center to deliberately work to take a more incremental approach using the 10 lessons or the thorn and hops paper, you know, taking some of those uh, techniques and applying them to the problems that we are addressing. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, an economist, Nobel Prize winning economist, um, is an excellent source to learn more about social ecological systems and sustainability. Again, there's nothing new in what I am talking with you about. Um, what is new is my realization that the approach is there. Um, and Eleanor really laid out uh, some very well argued um, the sort of directions and maps and uh, techniques to address these complex systems, which of what I presented today draw on to a large degree. Um, I also refer you to the Ruth Dumfries and Harina Nagender paper, which was in science. It's relatively short. Um, but it talks about sort of ecosystem management as a wicked problem, and it's a good entree into the literature and, and sort of philosophy of these wicked problems. And then lastly, I just want to thank everyone at NOAA in the Northeast region. The work that we do is important. 
managing the nation's fisheries, protecting the nation's endangered species, protecting and conserving habitats and ecosystems, addressing climate change, working to uh, have coexistence between multiple ocean uses. These are important problems. Um, they're problems that we're not going to solve. They are wicked problems. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for devoting parts of your career and parts of your life to solving this problem. So with that, Sarah, I'll stop and take any questions. Um, and thank you for your time and thank you for uh, listening. Great, thank you, John, for sharing your insights and sort of living your realizations that you needed to share, what you've learned. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that you can send in questions through the question panel. Um, I think there's an opportunity some, for some really rich discussions and sharing here. And if you have things that you think are relevant that you want shared too, you can, you can post those in the questions and the, we'll, we'll incorporate comments too. Um, the, the, so uh, we'll get started with a question that came in a little bit earlier. Um, as ocean conditions continue to change and at a faster rate, can you share your perspective on how you rectify an incremental approach that takes into account the complexity of ecosystems and people with the potential need for more dynamic responsive management? It's interesting because that, like when I wrote the Food for Thought article, that was one of the reviewers' comments is, isn't the time for an incremental approach past um, and don't we need more decisive top-down action? And I, you know, so there's an, there's an excellent article, which I will, um, I can share it with you, Sarah, or, you know, just send me an email, whoever asked this question, I can share it with you. It talks about climate change as a wicked problem as well. And, you know, I don't necessarily think that an incremental approach needs to be slow. Um, and so I, you know, we are in NOAA Fisheries, Northeast Fisheries Science Center, uh, working very hard to bring climate change into our fisheries management processes. It has been a relatively slow road to date, um, but I think because of the slow incremental engagement, the whole system, all, you know, many of the stakeholders are realizing the urgency um, and starting to think about working faster. So on the East Coast, uh, the, the three federal fisheries management councils have sort of were, are now working with NOAA fisheries to do a scenario planning effort to think about what is the future going to look like and what management steps can they take to address the future. And so, you know, I think, I think the, the, the incremental approach recognizes that it's uh, the, the change which we can create is more lasting. Um, than a uh, top-down sort of here's the answer, this is what you need to do approach. So yes, I understand the issue is urgent um, and NOAA fisheries, NOAA, it's a priority for us. Um, and we are working with our fisheries management partners uh, and that speed of that work is increasing rapidly. So I, I, I think my opinion that the we have set the stage for the incremental approach to be successful. Okay, thank you, John. And um, I'm posting a link that um, Hassan sent in uh, with a relevant uh, World Bank feature on climate change, the wicked problem. It, then okay. that went into the chat. Okay, um, some really good questions. Uh, let's see. Fishers often mistrust scientists' advice. Scientists are often skeptical of what fishers say. Can you give an example of good practice that has bridged the gap between those viewpoints and what learning insight you would draw from it? I mean, good practice, listening, um, working in good faith with, um, you know, again, the, sometimes the perspectives are similar um, and sometimes the perspectives are different. And so when the perspectives are similar, I think recognizing that. So where perspectives have been similar in the past several years, um, uh, we you know, put out an assessment which indicated that the Atlantic herring stock was at 
uh, very low levels um, and members of industry supported that and worked with us on that. We worked together on that. So the perspectives were in line. Um, similarly with Atlantic Mackerel, a uh, very similar outcome. And so from my perspective, when I, when I hear somebody say, my perspective is different than yours, I don't approach that from a place of mistrust. I approach that from a place of curiosity um, because I know that it's not de facto that their perspective is gonna be different than ours because I, I have examples of where they're not. And so it's a place to ask questions and to think about potentially um, doing some work together to explore those differences. So I don't know if that answered the question, but um, I think it's really listening and then trying to work together to reconcile perspectives. Okay, thank you, John. Um, there's a question, how do our current regulations, such as the Magnuson-Stevens Act, constrain our ability to, or in your ability, to make the needed incremental changes? So yeah, I'm not a lawyer, um, and you know, there's been, you know, there's, there's conversations about changing Magnuson-Stevens Act, um, and that's, you know, that is beyond where I have influence. Um, so where I have influence is working in the current laws, and in the current under the current laws that we have. Um, and I, you know, I think I, I often question if I, you know, when I hear, oh, we can't do that, ergo, we need to change the law, um, because I, I think about how much time is going to be spent changing the law, um, and how, what's the opportunity cost loss in that time to trying to work through using the current law, but work together to find solutions that work. And so, you know, given that I have no stake, no power in changing Magnuson, um, we really are focusing on what can we do under our current authorities to address questions like climate change or wind energy development. Okay, thank you, John. And there's a lot of question sort of how uh, how incrementalism fits into sort of a, a larger bureaucratic framework. So I'll go to a few of those. Um, could you please relate the incremental approach to the federal budget cycle, friend or foe? Friend or foe? Well, I mean, does, again, uh, the <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's like the federal budget cycle is something which is beyond my realm of influencing. So I would treat from just from my perspective. I haven't thought of that question before. From my perspective, I would just say it's an external factor that we need to deal with. I don't. You know, it's not okay, a very thank you. insightful answer, but there's some things that you can do things about, and you know, spend your energy there. And there's some things that you can't do anything about. So uh, take it as a given, and then work within those constraints. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a few comments I'll share. Uh, there was not a question, but rather a comment. I think both approaches, bottom-up, incremental, and top-down, are relevant to fisheries management. Again, as you say, there's not one approach to address fisheries management. I'll keep my, man my options open when addressing complex fisheries management. Um, I agree. I then, think let's see. recognizing that there are different approaches um, and that we might because of our background, go to one or the other more naturally. Um, and sort of that, you know, question inertia, when you are sort of falling to incremental or rational, at least stop and ask yourself, is this the right approach? Or is this the approach that I'm just falling to naturally? So it's question inertia would be the lesson that I would apply there. Yeah. Um, another question, really interesting talk and i could see how conventional fisheries management is an incremental approach but that the past and predominantly current path is currently the wicked problem uh, by managing by single species or stocks given a range of challenges including the fact that folks are very busy continuing in this path how do we question current inertia and if we decide to change such as to, uh, focusing on multi-species or even ecosystem-based approaches 
Yeah, man. So that's um, it's an excellent question. I think that it is. It's relevant to question inertia. I think it's also relevant to the other question about you know, well, to make progress, we need to change Magnuson. Um, and there have been recent examples of a multi-species approach, um, not under Magnuson, but in a state-managed fishery uh, with Atlantic Menhaden, um, and they've set up ecological reference points uh, in a multi-species model with Atlantic Menhaden and striped bass. Um, so that can be done. We're not precluded from doing that, um, but it is, it gets to the questions, the point of view is where are we spending our time? And you know, similarly with ecosystem-based fisheries management, um, we're in one of the you know I work we work with the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. We've been working with them, you know, sort of in this you know more of an incremental approach, uh, using risk assessment to then identify where their where the greatest risks are, and then working on uh, mitigating that risk through science and in what's called ecosystem approaches to fisheries management. So I, I think I think this question has the right, it's, it's correct, it's that where are we choosing to spend our time and our effort? It's not that we are restricted from spending our time or effort in, you know, we can't do multi-species or we can't do ecosystem-based fisheries management. So we need to steer a lot more of our resources and effort into the sort of an ecosystem approach into multi-species approaches. I agree with that. We, you know, similarly, we need to steer it more into bringing climate change into our fisheries management, into our protected species management. And that's, you know, as director of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, that you know, trying to work on making those course changes is, is something that I'm doing that we are doing throughout NOAA Fisheries. Okay, thank you, John. Um, what advice do you have for early career environmental management professionals? Seems like burnout from working on seemingly unsolvable problems is rampant. Well, I, you know, I think burnout's rampant right now, so I'm not sure that I would put it down to unsolvable environmental problems. You know, I think the we all need to uh, recognize the effect of the pandemic on on sort of where we all are. So I think burnout's an issue now, but yeah, I mean, working on unsolvable environmental problems, I don't think they're unsolvable. Um, you know, again, I'm an optimist, and so I bring that sort of, you know, uh, if I if you get to a problem which seems unsolvable, you you know, you can try harder, you can try a different approach you can sort of, you know, and spend, so if you think about it in this wicked problem concept, look at those different components, maybe spend some time learning about the perspectives of other stakeholders, spend some time trying to reconcile those perspectives. Um, and so, but I, you know, I think these questions is, is you know, one of the first questions brought up. These questions are pressing, they're urgent for us now. Um, and we're gonna need everybody to work, you know, as hard as we can to, to maybe not solve these problems, but make progress on these problems. Okay, thank you, John. Um, a question that came in a bit earlier, um, what are the differences between an incremental approach and adaptive approach for fisheries I, management? I think, you know, largely they're, they're the same, um, you know, just slightly different terminology, you know, incremental approach, iterative approach, adaptive approach, um, and I guess maybe adaptive is, is you know, I would argue is a, is a better word um, because adaptive means sort of that you're, you're doing something, learning from it, and then taking your next step in reference to your past step. Um, and when you, you know, if you think about incremental or iterative, it doesn't necessarily imply that you're learning. And so, you know, I, I do think it's they're very similar ideas, and we really need to be thinking about adaptive management, sort of iterative management cycles with learning on each iteration. Uh, we have a and, comment that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Well, yeah, and just like you know, the, the other you know, from a science you know, my scientific training, I said, you know, early in my career, you, know, you try to get a problem down to a, a size in which you can answer it through deductive reasoning, hypothesis testing, you know, that in that adaptive management 
sort of iterative cycle, you can apply some of those same principles. So you you say you're going to take a management action, and if we truly are thinking of these as learning cycles, then we could also say, and you know, here are the three or four possible outcomes from this action. And then next time you come around the iteration, what what were the outcomes? And use that as sort of a hypothesis testing to see if you're understanding the system correctly. And so I, I, I think that's you know, if we try to you know, fisheries management has these elements of an incremental approach in them. So how can we strengthen what we already have? Okay, thank you, John. Um, a question, does the Northeast Fisheries Science Center have a policy or defined strategy internally to integrate um, or respect perspectives across different roles and responsibilities, such as fisheries management and habitat or species protection? Um, and does it include direction on how to bring together the different tools from, from these perspectives for marine management, both spatial and non-spatial? Um, we don't have a policy, um, but that's an interesting idea to work more internally to develop tools to help our scientists work more collaboratively. As I said, um, you know, one of my goals for taking becoming director of the Northeast Fishery Science Center is to really create an environment where science and scientists can flourish. And so that question, my answer is no, but that's an excellent idea. Um, and I wrote that down. And so trying to help in that environment, create more tools and opportunities for our scientists to work together um, on these problems is, you know, I can certainly, that's an excellent idea. And we'll make, I can't say I'll make that happen, but it's, uh, you know, and we can, I'm interested in pursuing that. Okay, great. Um, I'll just say, and there was another comment that came uh, in from Alejandro. Um, EBM should also include a social science capacity building component, especially addressing the next generation of fisheries scientists. Which yeah, so there's two you know, questions with. there. Right? One is social scientists, and 100% agree. Um, we are fortunate at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center to have a very strong group of social scientists. And then the next generation um, is sort of in the you know, career development piece. Um, fisheries does not have a really strong sort of education and training component to our mission, but you know, we recognize the importance of that um, and have been increasingly investing in setting up uh, internships and opportunities to sort of train that, you know, the postdoctoral and graduate student and late undergraduate student. Um, and then when you look at the, the array of opportunities across NOAA, you know, trying to make sense of that just to, from you know, my perspective to really sort of help develop very clear pathways to train scientists um, and that, you know, clearly is something that we are working on with our academic um, partners. They have a much you know, greater part of their mission in terms of educating. Um, so we work with a number of universities in the region to develop those pathways and better articulate those pathways for young scientists, including social scientists. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Another question, are there difficulties in convincing policymakers to apply an incremental approach, which might mean reversing policies in two years and having to justify that to their constituents? I mean, I, I like conceptually, I can see that. Um, I haven't come across that yet because I haven't, in the work that I have been involved in that the northeast center is involved in i don't see i don't see it being conveyed as reversals um so but in that if if you are in a situation where your your direction and policy is you know flipping one way or the other that's going to be create challenges for your problem in the future for redressing your problem in the future most certainly 
you know, one example, just as I talk through this and think, try to come up with an example, I think the, you know, Atlantic mackerel is a good example. The, you know, stock assessments that were coming out of the Science Center for a period of time were very optimistic, indicating that there was a very large biomass. Um, you know, there, you know, the industry started to build up around um, those assessments. But then the 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 assessment perspective, the perspectives coming out of assessments change, you know, relatively rapidly, um, and you know the industry, you know, has been sort of trying to uh, use the mackerel that are there, but you know, meet the right level of capitalization. And yes, that was a there was a you know a disconnect between the science and the sort of the regulations and the industry. Um, and we've been working through that by working together on better understanding sort of the science behind the macro assessment and then applying the assessment. So I think in those types of situations, it's a challenge, something to keep an eye out for, um, but sort of this incremental approach, the relationship building, understanding the perspectives of different stakeholders almost provides a buffer to that criticism. Okay, thanks, John. Um, we have a lot of great questions we're not going to get to, unfortunately. Uh, we probably just have time for one or two more. Um, I do else here at the bottom if people would like to continue the conversation. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good on my email. Some days are worse than others, but great. And I'll I'll be providing these questions too, so you can okay. see what they look like. Um, okay. Um, then there's there's a saying that you cannot manage what you don't measure. We do this for fisheries, but how do we measure the outputs of our science? We're managing science first, so it seems like an 11th thing to do would be to develop a robust measurement system of scientific impact. You can't manage what you can't measure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. Um, but then, what was the second part? Was um, developing a robust measurement system of our science? Correct, of the scientific impact. Of the scientific impact, and I think yeah, that's another. Yeah, we don't do that now, or I can't think of an example. Um, but that's an interesting idea. Is to you know, establish metrics of the quality of our science, um, and then you know work to sort of improve and track that. Um, so yeah, I mean it's an interesting idea. I'll give it some thought as to you know how to you know what that would look like. Um, but yes, thank you for this interesting idea. And we have a comment uh, from Paul that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that uh, that counts can be counted. Uh, so, on the general premise, um, let's see. Um, one last question. Okay, is there a danger that an incremental approach is interpreted as a risk-averse approach? A risk-averse approach can favor the status quo. Um, so then, the the counter is that a rational sort of like you give it to an expert and the expert gives you an answer is not a risk averse approach because it could be you know completely different from what is currently happening so yes um, there is a risk you know in a sense you're in an incremental approach where you are involving different perspectives i think by nature particularly when you start it's going to be slower because it's likely that the perspectives will be very different. Um, but if working through an incremental approach, you can bring perspectives more into an alignment, um, I think it can then work as quickly as sort of the alternative approach. In terms of being risk averse, I think it comes into what we've, we've talked about is you, know, you need to look at the inertia of the problem um, and if if the group thinks that the, you're moving too slowly, that you're being risk averse, then you can change. You know, that group by looked questioning inertia can work to change the pace. And so, yeah, I think it's a it's a risk, um, but I think it's one which uh, 
can be mitigated. Okay. Thank you, John. And I think I speak for, for many or most uh, by saying we all appreciate the opportunity to sort of step back from our daily work and think big picture about uh, fisheries management and, and other things which could benefit uh, from an incremental approach and just think about how we're doing things. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to put this together and um, present this to us. And we appreciate everyone who was who was able to come today and ask questions. Um, John's got his email up there um, for any follow-ups. And thank you to all. We hope to see you on some future webinars. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Sarah. Much appreciated. And thank you, everyone, for the great questions and for listening. OK. All right. Okay. Bye, everyone. Take care.